recording. There we go. Hi everyone, it's uh, two o'clock my time in Brisbane, Australia, and uh, we are live with our uh, February 2020 webinar for Australasian uh, chapter of Geosynthetics Society, International Geosynthetics Society, ACIGS. Um, so we have gone through these a few of these slides before, but um, so you're aware of um, the um, geographical location of ACIGS. We basically are in Australia, in New Zealand, and uh, Pacific Islands, and um, we do um, activities such as uh, these webinars, and also we do conferences and seminars and um, trainings and the publications of the IGS uh, with the two main uh, prestigious uh, journals, Geosynthetics International and Geotextiles and Geomembranes. That I'm sure you are um, familiar with. As um, an IGS or ACIGS member, you get uh, free access to these uh, journals. Um, again, our website, www.acigs.org. So make sure you visit our website and I'll show you a few of the um, um, interesting tabs that we have on our website, such as the resources. So we are collecting a video library of all our seminars that we have recording of the webinars and um, all the resources are accessible to the members on our website. We also have a um, full page, as you can see, of um, uh, events planned for um, this February and March with um, some more upcoming for the next few months. Um, to go through a few of them quickly, we have um, the webinar today on load bearing bridge apartments and then we have another webinar uh, on February 28th um, on floating cover systems for uh, reservoirs and ponds. And then we have a week full of events in um, um, two cities, Melbourne and Brisbane, and we are doing geomembrane workshop series. Uh, we have international speaker, Boyd Ramsey, coming to Australia, and also a lot of um, our local experts in geomembranes. Uh, we have um, two events for young members and uh, students and graduates. Make sure you check our events page on our website and um, register for any of these events that um, you're interested in. Um, today's webinar, Geofabrics are um, our sponsor, so we thank uh, Geofabrics Australasia for their support of this event. Um, Geofabrics are exclusive partner of Tenzar in Australia and New Zealand and supplier of TW3 wall system for high wall and high load. This webinar, um, as you know, will be recorded and we um, added to our library on our uh, website. So during the webinar, if you have any questions, make sure you type them in the Q&A uh, section of the Zoom platform, and then we get to them at the end of, end of the presentation. Today, we have Mike Dobby um, presenting on load-bearing bridge apartments supported on polymer geogrid reinforced fill. So as a um, very brief, um, um, bio from Mike Dobby, he's a geotechnical engineer, graduated in civil engineering from Bristol University in the UK and um, later obtaining a master's degree in soil mechanics from Imperial College London under Professor Bishop. He is a chartered engineer and a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers in the UK. Since graduating in 1973, he has worked in the field of geotechnical engineering for British consultant WS Atkins and Partners. Delft Soil Mechanics Laboratory in the Netherlands and Singapore, and American Specialist Consultant Dames and more. More recently, he has worked for Acer Consultants, Nair Hyder, previously uh, Freeman, Fox and Partners, being seconded to establish the Central Soil Laboratory near Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia to provide high quality soil testing for the North South Expressway project. Mike joined Tenzar International in 1991 and currently is the regional manager for Asia Pacific based in Jakarta in Indonesia with responsibilities for the development of design methods and software for both reinforced soil structure 
and mechanical stabilization techniques. Mike has been making regular visits to Australia for more than 25 years, conducting workshops and seminars in rainforest and stabilized soil techniques. And um, here is a picture of um, Mike and me um, doing a um, podcast uh, that was uh, maybe two months ago that uh, we recorded this and um, it's on YouTube, the link is there. Uh, if you're interested, you can watch it. And um, I'll hand over to Mike very quickly. Thank you, Mike, and um, we listen to your presentation. Oh, thanks, Ian, mate. Um, uh, thanks for your very nice introduction. It's, as usual, nice to be back here in Australia. I've been here many times before, and um, this particular topic, I think, from the point of view of geosynthetics is quite nice, because if you like, it's at the, the high-risk end of what we can do with reinforced soil, uh, supporting bridges, bridge decks. Um, today I have quite a lot of material to get through. I, I need to move fairly quickly. So uh, again, and if you have any questions as we go along, as you know, you can you can send them in, and, and if we can deal with them in the time we shall do. I guess if not, we can respond later on. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Right. So let's get going. There's a bit of an outline of what I want to talk about today. So we'll start off with some simple uh, defini definitions of some historical information. We look at a few examples of these structures, uh, and then a, a few brief words on design. Today, in a, in a webinar like this, I can't go into design in any detail, but at least to, to show you where you can go to for help on the design side. A few words of importance on material properties, and then we'll look at some um, measured performance, both static uh, and using shaking, shaking table testing to simulate Earthquakes. So here we are. A typical example. Load. Oh, sorry, this is a bridge abutment, but it's not load bearing. In in this case, the bridge you see there is carried independently through a structure within the soil mass, and the reinforced fill is simply forming. In this case, that the rather nice terraced wall around the edges. Another example. Um, the same again, in this case, is a bit more complex because there are two bridge abutments, but, but they are also both independently supported from the reinforced fill. And the third example, in this case, slightly different because in this case, the bridge deck is outside the reinforced soil structure. Um, and, and this is, this is a, an approach to a bridge uh, built in New Zealand, just north of Auckland. So in these particular cases, we, we have the bridge load being carried independently from the reinforced soil. So the previous picture looked much like this, where you see a structure in front of the reinforced soil block. The alternative is to have the structure inside the reinforced soil block. Uh, and then for designers, there's a bit of a discussion then, what do you do about the interaction between that structure and the reinforced fill? Um, do you allow them to come into contact or do you keep them separated, and in some cases people decide that some kind of isolation of that structure is the best thing to do, so you, you end up with a, a situation like this. But in other cases also sometimes people actually have the reinforced fill directly in contact. And now, anyhow, today we want to leave that behind uh, and move on to a, a, the, the approach where we will carry the load of the bridge through the reinforced soil structure. And here's a, an early example. I thought we'd have quite a few pictures in this, this webinar today and uh, uh, to give you images of these things. But this is going back 30 years in the UK. It's actually a temporary bridge. Um, and they are using a polymer re reinforced fill. In this case, it's a fairly good quality fill. Um, just to mention that the, uh, the term often used in the US for this type of structure is a true abutment. We tend to call them load bearing bridge abutments. And I've, I've shortened that to LBBA throughout this webinar. So whenever you see that, and I forget to mention it, uh, it's referring to this form of structure. In this case, the bridge would be using bearings. Um, there we are, we see the nature of the fill. This is a, a high quality, well gridded granular fill. Uh, there is the structure nearing completion. This in fact is a temporary structure. 
Uh, and, and here it is completed. It's using a post and panel style of facing, which was quite popular in those days. Um, and in this case, please be aware that that bridge deck, the load from that is being carried through the reinforced soil mass. In this case, Miller is a, is a mining company, so the live loads going across that bridge are quite high because they're from mining trucks. So you can see in this particular case using a, um, a load-bearing bridge abutment to carry heavy uh, live loads. So there we see a, a cross-section of it. So we're now talking about the case where the load from the bridge deck is carried directly through the reinforced soil structure. Um, and this is the option with bearings, which perhaps traditionally most of the early bridges were built like that. But now there is an increased popularity of using integral abutments. So in the integral abutment, you don't have a bearing. It's, it's a, if you're like a monolithic piece of concrete. Um, and one rather nice benefit when you're considering that form of bridge is that the reinforced soil mass is slightly ductile. It can deform a little bit. So that's a good thing because so will the bridge deck. So this is the becoming more and more popular, this, this form of load bearing bridge abutment. And, and we'll have a look at one right now. So much more recently, this is uh, just a few years ago in, in the United Kingdom again, where you can see them putting the, the lower part of the, the bank seat directly on top of the reinforced soil structure there. That's on top. And this one actually is carrying a, a bridge over the A24 near the town of Horsham. So anybody who knows UK a bit, they, they, and they know the south of England, they may well have been down into this part of the world. There's the view from the front. You can, you can see from the, uh, the steel starter bars where the bank seat is. And there it is now with the bridge in position. So importantly, that bridge is being supported fully by the, uh, the reinforced soil structure. Uh, and you can see from this picture, this bridge is a, is a full span right across the highway. So it's about a 28 meter span. So the loadings you'll see in a minute are quite significant. Here's another view, much the same. And finally, a few, a little while later, fully in use. Um, so it's a very nice example of, of this technology being used and becoming certainly in the UK more popular and, and we'll see in a minute from some research in other places as well. Just to show you what it looks like from the point of view of the, the, the cross section of the structure. So there is the reinforced soil block. You'll notice the reinforcement quite dense, especially at the top, not surprisingly due to the the heavy loads. Uh, there's some more backfill behind. That's where the, the, the bridge sits. It's roughly to scale, this, this sketch. Some infill there and we build the road. So there, there is a, a simple cross section of that structure. <clears throat> Perhaps the interesting information is that the load coming down just there, right in front, it, it's very close to the, to the face. 300 kilopascal dead load plus about 200 kilopascal live load. So this, this is a very heavy load, but it can be handled very nicely by this form of structure. This is an, the, the title has changed now. Is this a new idea, the, these, these load-bearing bridge abutments? So I thought I'd just summarize some comments that came from a, a workshop in Munich uh, in, in June 2018, uh, where there was a session that was chaired by Dr. Jorge Zornberg about these, these forms of abutment structure. Uh, and he was, was part way through carrying out a, a survey, probably completed by now, about the use around the world of this form of structure. And, and he found that definitely the use is worldwide. It's, it's, it's used in many countries. And in some places, particularly US and the UK and Europe, Europe is on the increase. Um, so without a doubt, this is not a new idea. Uh, it's been around for a long time and you've already seen a temporary structure from 1990, but I thought I'd just show you another couple of examples because they're, they're quite nice. Um, so here is one built 30 years ago. Um, it's using that same post and panel style facing that we saw earlier on, but this is now a permanent structure. Um, it's built in the town of Banbury in the UK, designed to a, an old code and used then called B378. And here it is completed. So in, in the tradition of the UK, they put a nice brickwork finishing around the edge of it. So you, you've got no idea it's a reinforced soil structure, but there it was soon after completion all those years ago. And there's a similar view from a slightly different direction. 
So, I thought, well, what's it look, look like today? Um, it would be nice to find out without actually having to go to Banbury, although it's a very nice town, but, um, but luckily through the power of the internet, we can do this kind of thing. So here's a picture of it 20 year, 28 years after it had been completed. Uh, and also with, with the further technology of the internet, we can get a nice live view on the top and you can see that the, the railing on the right hand side is, is where the bridge is and you, you can also just make out the expansion joint behind the truck. So this bridge has been functioning as it was designed now for, for over 30 years. So a very, very successful structure. Let me just show you one more from, from some time ago. Not, not as, this is not 30 years ago. It's more like about 25 or so, I think. But the, the, the interesting difference here that you can see in the cross section, we have the reinforced soil block. But in this case, the subsoils are soft. So they've used piles. And then above that, they've used what we call a load transfer platform to, to place the structure on top of. So there's a nice combination there of, uh, of geosynthetic technology being used for this one structure. So that's a simple cross section. Let's have some pictures. This one's got the railway line beside it. So you can see there the trains going past during construction. Um, they're using a modular block technique. It uh, doesn't look particularly elegant or beautiful in that picture. But again, because this is the UK, uh, when it comes to completion, uh, they face it with brickwork. It's quite a nice way of doing this. You, you can actually just have a simple block with a tie method where you can then tie the brickwork into it if you want the, the traditional brickwork look. So there it is, almost finished, and here it is after completion. Um, and it's, it's a nice looking bridge. And I, I thought, again, how about today? So back to the internet again, and there we can see from the, the, the brickwork color there quite clearly, there is the bridge happily in service just a, a short time ago. So two, two nice examples from uh, that sort of era. What about design? I thought, I thought I'd make a few comments about design. Um, and perhaps one of, the, one of the, the best known ones from years gone by was BS8006, of course, still uh, in full use today. Originally published in 1995, and it, in, in section six, uh, it includes the requirements for load bearing bridge abutment design. So uh, you can create a design procedure from that code. Uh, it covers Ultimate limit state, serviceability limit state, but it, of course there is no earthquake loading included if, if that's a problem you're dealing with in your particular area. However, you can incorporate this into a piece of software. So here is a, uh, um, a program uh, for reinforced soil design where you can activate a little module to put in a bank seat like that. You put in the dimensions and loads and so on. Uh, and then you do a bit of a calculation Oh, you can, oh, by the way, you, you, you can also fix the post-construction strain limit that you want to work to in the reinforcement, which is a, a rather important thing in bridge abutments. There's a little, a little subroutine carried out to, to check the stability of the bank seat itself and also calculate the forces being applied on top of the reinforced soil block. So there is the full system now, uh, and there is a, a design where, where everything is adequate. We have a suitable layout of reinforcement to support that particular load so that that is very nice again th there is in this particular uh, method the bs8006 and, and this piece of software you can also carry out a check on the post construction strain to make sure that the average value remains below 0.5 percent and that's what we're seeing there the the little diagrams in the middle of the screen at the moment are distributions of strain along each piece of reinforcement uh, and the diagram on the right is the average of each one and you can see how it stays well below 0.5%. So this is the kind of design procedure you can make use of. So there is the design with everything okay. Um, what about other codes? Well, of course, another well-known one internationally and nationally is the AFTO LRFD bridge design specification. Uh, this one, from the point of view of designing these structures, covers ULS and earthquake loading. Um, and there is a, 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 another document, FHWA guide NHI 10024 and 025. These provide a lot more detail, these documents. Um, and if you're interested to see the details of the calculation procedure, uh, if you find your way to Appendix E5, which you can see the cover page there, that gives you a full um, uh, worked example as to how the method works. So 
Again, this, is, this can be put into a piece of software. And if I put that same arrangement that I had last time into this method, uh, what you'll see on the lower part of that diagram, th those are some messages telling us that there are a few issues with this design. They're mainly coming through the issue of connection strength, which is dealt with in a, in a rather crude way in, in this design method. Um, if we're a bit more adventurous, we can switch to what we call a two-part wedge design method, which is what I've done here. Uh, and, and that then does a, does a far better, uh, has a far better way of checking um, the effect of connection strength in the design. So there we have the final design works very well. Uh, this is a, an image from the wedge checks uh, and the, the thing called CDR, the capacity demand ratio is if you like, that's a, we have a target there of being one or greater. And you can see on that particular wedge at about 65 degrees, just nicely above one. So uh, that's another approach to designing for these forms of structure. And there we have that finished design. There are other documents that have been published. This one was from a few years ago, also in the US, uh, on, the, on this form of structure. I'm not going to spend any time telling you anything about them, except to say that uh, if you're interested, you can get hold of these things fairly easily from the internet. Um, a more recent one is this one, published just two years ago. Um, and this is a fairly complete document. It includes earthquake loading. Um, so if you want a lot more information, then, then find your way to these documents and you can find all sorts of help there. So just to want to make a couple of comments on materials and material properties. Um, when you're talking about a reinforced soil structure to carry a bridge deck, then you obviously want to use good quality fills. Uh, so you're either going to be looking at, at a, a nicely well-graded sandy gravel, or something like a road sub-base material, uh, or even sands, and, and, and we'll see some examples of sand fill in a minute. So, Clearly, choice of soil type is an important part of, of uh, building up the specification and, and design uh, for this particular form of structure. Also, when it comes to the polymer reinforcement, um, we're, we're looking generally at 120 year design life or 100 year design life for bridge abutments. So we need to be very confident about the various properties we're using. Uh, in this case, we might want to know about the ultimate limit state, behavior, the, the serviceability limit state, and the seismic behavior as well. They're, they're all parts of a possible design that you might be looking at. So you need to investigate all of them. Um, the normal approach we have for design or for, for calculating long-term strength of, of reinforcement is, is an expression like this. This one is coming in this case from the current European practice. Um, where that, that formula you see in the middle is, is giving us the ultimate limit state design strength based on a number of other factors. So we start off on the top with the long-term strength coming from creep testing. And then we also need to apply a few other factors to take into account principally durability. We have one for weathering and another one for chemical and environmental effects. So um, this needs to be taken very seriously. I mean, it always needs to be taken seriously, but especially with load-bearing bridge abutments, because you are so reliant on these geogrids performing on, and, and providing their performance for a long time that um, uh, there, there is no option to take shortcuts. So they have to be very thoroughly investigated. For example, the kind of testing you might be looking at would be, of course, creep testing for polymer geogrids, um, where you, you, you hang weights on samples and you measure their behavior over a very long time periods. So th these are vital parts of building up knowledge of the long-term properties of these geogrids. When it comes to durability, we could have a, in fact, we could have a whole webinar on durability. Maybe you like something you like to think about one day, but I'll mention it in just one slide here. Um, durability is vital. Um, the main agencies we think about are weathering, microbiological degradation, oxidation, and the effect of um, high and low pH through various sort of forms of liquids. Um, and we can investigate these in a number of ways. Uh, the, there are some well-known screening tests, which are relatively quick, um, but also what is vital for, for really understanding the, the long-term properties are long-term exposure tests, which can take several years. These are vital. If you, if you really want to know or understand thoroughly the situation with durability of these materials. And just a little point I like to make, especially when looking at the sunshine outside here at the moment, 
Durability is especially important in hotter climates because the, uh, generally the agencies of deterioration are becoming more aggressive as, as the environment becomes hotter. So uh, please be aware of that. So I thought we'd then look at some measured performance. And uh, again, we'd, we'd start at some, uh, a structure, a little one, built a long time ago, but it was a very early one, um, built up in Scotland, in, in, in Stirling. Uh, 1986 and you can see from the picture there it's actually just a pedestrian underpass uh, but it's carrying a, a main road so the you've got full highway loadings coming through the abutments um, and because it was a very early structure the T well it was then called the TRRL but now the TRL they got involved and, and there is a specific report on this if you want to know more about it it's quite an extensive report uh, and a lot of monitoring was done um, to, to look at the behavior of this particular structure. So there is a cross section of the structure. You can see reinforced soil block, quite wide compared to its height. But in this particular case, the structure was underlain by compressible soils. So they also used, I don't know if you can read it, it's rather small there, but that rectangular block at the bottom is a, is, um, a GSL mattress. It's a, it's a one meter high mattress formed from geogrid which in those days was called a, G G a GSL mattress, but that, that was helping to support this structure over the, the soft soils underneath. So that's what it looks like. You can see that it's a full height panel that was inclined backwards. Um, and then the structure sits on top, in this case, with a, a bearing. And if you look into the report, you will see information. Total outward deformation at the top of the panel was about 20 millimeters at the maximum and it rapidly stabilized during the, the life of the structure. Uh, and interestingly, the, the total settlement reached about 58 millimeters because of the slightly compressible uh, subsoils. Um, and it's often the case that you, people get really worried about horizontal deformations of these structures, but you need to think about the vertical ones as well, especially for bridges. Um, and the strains in the geogrids, maximum was about 0.7%. This is post-construction strain. Uh, and the average is about 0.3%. So nicely within the sorts of limits we'd be looking at today. And again, using the internet, there is the, the bridge today. You can just to make out, see from the parapet on the far side um, behind the crash barrier, uh, that's where the bridge is. And you can also just, just see the um, expansion joint on the left-hand side. So still happily performing its function um, many years later. And I thought we'd look at one bit closer to where we're sitting today. This, this is, uh, I think, quite well known to many people, Barney's Point Bridge, which is over the Tweed River, um, down at the south of Queensland. And this was built in 1993, so it's, it, it's been there a long time now. Um, it was built as a, essentially a steep slope um, using a, a series of terraces with modular blocks. Um, so you can see from that image there, uh, the, the general form of the structure. And, it, and it's a load-bearing abutment. So uh, you can see there the, the main materials being used. You, we've got polymer geogrids and we've got sand backfill. And also in the distance there, you can see the old bridge. that was, it was, This was replacing it. And it's a sand fill. And if, if there's any question as why why are the gaps between the geogrids, I'll, I'll answer that one right now because it is a good question. Because of the curvature on the wall, it was decided that they didn't want the grids to overlap. So they, they, they spaced them on, at all, in, in, on uh, alternate courses so that there was no grid to grid um, uh, touching, if you like, towards the ends of the geogrid where they were converging. Uh, so that's why you see those gaps. There was extensive instrumentation because this is a very early structure. These are load bolts to try and measure the load in the geogrid, which really overread the load by quite a lot, large amount because they were so stiff. And also some strain gauges placed on the geogrid as well. But perhaps from the point of view of um, long-term knowledge of performance, some of the most important instruments were the inclinometers and there were a number placed but the ones of greatest importance were this one I1 which is at the toe of the structure and I2 which is on the third terrace and, and I want to look at the behavior that we see in those two inclinometers. So here's a cross section, make sure it's clear. Yes, I think it's not bad. Right, so, um, and, and in fact, when I prepared these slides, I always wanted to do this. I always wanted to superimpose the 
the monitoring data on the cross section so that you could see clearly how the deformations related to the cross section of the structure. So we can see it very clearly there. We have the, um, the existing soils underneath the structure. Uh, there's, a, there's an upper sand layer, which there was some doubt whether or not it was a fill. And then above that, you have the tiered structure, four tiers supporting the, uh, the bank seat. Uh, and then the layers of geogrid are the, of course, the horizontal line. So quite a nice representation of the overall structure itself. So overall height 12 meters, and you can see there the locations of I1 and I2 superimposed on the cross section. So what I want to do now is to add to that the horizontal deformation data that came from the inclinometers. And this is I2, um, and I'll explain the colors in a minute when we come when we look at I1 as well, because you'll get a, a description of what the colors mean. But you can see what's happened is that within the lower alluvial sand, there's a small deformation. Then in this upper sand. There's a lot of horizontal deformation, and then within the reinforced soil block, um, not very much. Uh, then if I add I1, I1 rather confirms the behavior within the upper sand. Uh, I don't have the red line. So what do the colors mean? Uh, the blue is after no nine months after the start of readings, which was just before completion. Um, and then the green one is 17 months, and, and the red one is 20 years. So that means that from green to red represents, what, 18 and a half years of, of, of behavior. So it's, it's, a, it's a really excellent record of behavior of a geotechnical structure. So that's what it looks like. And so what, what would that mean in terms of strain? So if we take that piece of geogrid where I put a blue line, and if you assume that the far end of it didn't move, then that would be around about a 0.5% average strain um, based on a 50 millimeter movement uh, at the front end. So within the targets that we'd normally be interested. Um, however, you can see that a lot of deformation was going on within the foundation soils. So if I take a bit of a liberty and I set the foundation deformations back to zero like that, then I think this paints, paints a, rather, a rather different image about the way the reinforced soil block itself has behaved. And what you'll see there is that over those 18 and a half years, there was almost no significant deformation within the reinforced soil block itself. Now, this, this is not a rigorous approach to this uh, particular demonstration, but I think it fairly gives a fairly good idea that the reinforced soil mass has not deformed significantly um, underneath that bridge above. Most of the deformation has come from the foundation soils. Uh, this this is, is a, a well-known case study here in uh, Australia. Um, a number of papers were published early on and also some more recent ones. And if you want to know more about it, you can hunt around and find those, those, those publications. But uh, I think it's a particularly excellent case study for this form of structure. So that was Barney's Point Bridge. Yeah, so that, that deformation there would be at about a 0.1% elongation of the geogrid if you, if you take it at that particular point. Then I got this particular project. Um, when, when I was first preparing this presentation, which was a little while ago, and I, I presented it already in, in New Zealand, in Singapore, Malaysia, and in and Indonesia, I, I got in touch with my colleagues around the world, and I said, look, have you got any interesting projects of load-bearing bridge abutments? And I really got a large number, and in, in particular from the Netherlands, where um, I received quite a long list of them. And, and I, I can't show them all to you in this, in this webinar, but um, I picked this one out because, for me, it's, it's a particularly impressive one um, and it's got, some very, it's got some nice data to go with it. So let's have a look. It's at Den Bosch in the Netherlands and uh, the structure we're interested in is the one inside the, the yellow ring on the image at the moment. So let's have a look at that particular structure. So first of all, a plan view. In this particular case, the blue lines are the reinforced soil retaining walls. Uh, the bridge abutment is where you can see it written down there, bottom right corner, and, and the bridge heads off towards the, um, the right uh, as we look down on that, that plan view. The walls were built using what we call full height panels. In this particular case, you cast the entire height, uh, you cast short bits of geogrid into it, which you will later extend uh, with, with the full lengths using a connection. Um, 
A nice thing about this is that you can get all of the panels up early on. So one visit of a crane, which is probably a good thing to reduce costs. So there you can see the panels all propped. Um, and then once they're in position, you start to go around the other side and backfill it. You can see here, this is also a sand backfill. This is the Netherlands. The Netherlands has a lot of sand. So they're normally using sand for these structures. Uh, and in each, as, as you reach each layer of geogrid, you will, you will connect the full length you will then slightly tension it to keep it flat uh, and place more fill. Here is the structure on, on one side nearing completion. And this is the other side. You can see in this particular case, they were wor working very close to a, uh, an active railway line. So uh, this, this technique allows you to do that. So they're still building on the left side, but they've got trains running on the right side. But, so this is possible with this, this type of for, form of construction. And then they come to placing the bridge girders. Now, this is when I think I, I did almost fall off my seat when I was looking at this information because um, those bridge girders are spanning 53 meters and they're going to be carrying a railway loading. Uh, for people familiar with bridges, you will know that's quite a long span, especially a long span when it's carrying a railway loading. So um, I think it's probably the longest span bridge I'm aware of supported by a reinforced fill abutment. So, uh, that, that also gives it a bit of a record, I think. I, don't, I haven't heard of a longer one. Anyhow, I, I think that particular image is, is, is really quite impressive. There's another view of the, the beams now sitting on the bank seats, heading off across the, uh, uh, the, the railway. It's crossing over. And of course, we, because of the interest in this, uh, they did some instrumentation. In this case, simple surface targets were placed on the panels like that. Uh, and we can see them that you can just make out the white dots on, on the uh, two, two of the panels there. So let's look at the results on that one, B2. So what you can see there is it's in Dutch, but I think it's not too difficult to see what's going on. Um, the, the green inclined line is the initial position and then the panel, and that's when it was first placed before any backfill was placed. So uh, as you fill the structure, it of course does move forward slightly, which is what we expect. But then during service, uh, very little additional deformation. So that is the kind of deformation. If you can't read it, the, the distance between the horizontal lines is 20 millimeters. So that's the sort of deformation that was going on mainly during construction for that particular project. One thing, oh, I forgot to mention that there, there were some hiccups. I'll, just go, I'll go back a slide. Um, there, there was a sudden jump slightly in, in the record because something that was not designed for originally, they, they put some piles through the reinforced fill. These are nothing to do with the bridge. I guess they're for the gantries, I'm not sure. But um, this piling caused a bit more deformation of the reinforced soil mass, but, but it was all taken care of by the nature of the structure. So this did not cause any significant issues by piling through the reinforced soil mass after it was completed. There is a picture of the approach going towards the bridge. The bridge is in the distance on the left. And here is the bridge itself with a rather interesting um, finish. And finally, I think we have a train heading over it. So I must say, when, when I first saw this, I was really amazed. This is quite an impressive project of a load-bearing bridge abutment carrying railway loading with a 53-meter span. Just the last few words. I like to talk about earthquakes. Um, uh, earthquake loading is included in Australian codes, and it's, but it's not very high. However, in New Zealand, of course, it's a major issue. So I thought we'd start in New Zealand with a few uh, bits of experience there. Um, one thing that's quite rare in, in, uh, in, in this whole area of, of uh, reinforced soil is to find structures that have been shaken by strong earthquakes. There are some around, of course, we'd be going to hunt them down after strong earthquakes, but this wall um, was, sh was shaken by the Kaikoura earthquake, uh, where the PGA, both the design and the actual one, around about 0.6 G. So I thought I'd just show you a picture. This was before, this was soon after construction, um, and here it is after the earthquake, uh, where, as it says here, the uh, it was a very strong, I mean, if those who remember the Kaikoura earthquake, especially anyone in New Zealand, they will rem remember it only too well, but um, magnitude around about 7.8 with some enormously high ground accelerations uh, near the fault break. Um, but this one probably shaken up to a point, about 0.6 G. And 
when you look carefully at it, it's, it's in perfectly excellent condition. Just behind the wall, there is a swale drain, it's just a, a cast in situ drain. There is not even separation from that drain uh, from the back of the, uh, of the modular blocks. So this is slightly off the, um, the subject of reinforced soil abutments, but it is a reinforced soil structure that's been shaken strongly by an earthquake. So just to let you see what these can look like in, 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 uh, in a, it's a laboratory or controlled situation, a shaking table test. Um, shaking table tests are normally done on scale models, uh, but this particular one is full scale. This is work done by, uh, in the US, University of California, San Diego, where they have an outdoor shaking table where you can build, build full scale structures on top. Um, and in this particular case, the wall is six meters high and was shaken up to 0.55 G. And the model uh, weighs in at 827 tons, so it's, it's quite significant. So here's some nice images. So there, there is the shaking table is the, the very white area. Uh, and, and the building in the background is a two-story building where they have all the control equipment and everything else to, to do the control, the testing, and to monitor the behavior of the structure. Um, there is the box that they build the structure inside. So that box, I guess, about eight meters or so high. And we now look down inside the box. So this is a sand fill. The, the facing is on the right, there's a gap in front of it. And you see there those yellow plates, that they're some of the many instruments that were uh, used to measure various aspects of the behavior while the structure was being shaken. So I have to apologize that this cross section is the other way around, if you can just sort of turn your way around, sort of spin your head around for a bit, but we now have the facing on, on the right hand side, but the, all those dots and, and uh, points on there represent different forms of instrumentation. Um, I'm not going to try and describe them in any, any detail, but we will look at the results of a few in a, in a, in a very nice video. I've shown this video and, and I'm sure many other people have many times, but it's still a remarkable um, way of looking at the behavior of, of this kind of structure when it's shaken strongly by an earthquake. So here is the video. Yes, I hope the sound is coming through, but you've got the two little video images. I suggest look top right, because top right is the backwards and forwards movement of the wall in inches, the scale on the bottom, if you can see that. Bottom left is the acceleration record. So in fact, the, the maximum experience accelera accelerations in that were well over 1G measured, but the, 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 the input acceleration was up to about 0.55G. It was actually an imitation in that one of the Kobe earthquake. Um, but, I mean, a fabulous piece of or demonstration. And I think one thing I like to, to, to remind people about when we look at this is that what you're seeing there, and, and it's one really important property of reinforced soil with polymer geogrids is ductility. Uh, the ability to deform, to absorb energy, but to recover. So, this is a, a cross section of the wall on, on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, we'll just look at the, the, the maximum minimum deformation. So if that was the initial position of the wall at point zero going up the wall in the, in the red dots, then the maximum outward position during shaking was something like that. The maximum inward position was back to there. And then when it had finished, it ended up almost where it started. So there, there is ductility in action, absorbing all the energy, but retaining its function. And that really is the aim of these structures. If they're going to be affected by strong earthquakes, then if this is a vital lifeline to a hospital or, or something like that in, in, in any particular area or, or the fire station or wherever the important equipment is, you want that, that road to remain serviceable. So it's a very good demonstration of that. One thing that was interesting is when they examined this structure afterwards, cracks were appearing, cracks behind, just behind the reinforced soil zone itself, and also cracks at the back of the blocks, or near the back of the box. Um, and there was also a sign of some slight bulging at the base. So if you, with a, bit of, a little bit of artistic license, put on there a possible failure mechanism, it's going to be something like a two-part wedge. And that's what gets mentioned in the 
the documentation and, and the published papers about the structure. So the nice thing is that if I now put this particular structure into a, the same program I showed you earlier on using a two-part wedge approach, this one also LRFD, then at 0.55G horizontal, we start to see the first two pink wedges. Pink wedges mean below the required safety target. And if we had the wedges within the backfill, they would be at about 45 degrees. So the nice thing is this is very close to what we see in reality. So what is quite nice here is that our, our simple basic design approaches, in this case using uh, limiting equilibrium, they get quite close to what happens in a very complex situation of, of the real dynamic behavior of that structure. So, so that's what it would look like. In fact, that wall was designed for 0.7G. So if I turn up the acceleration to 0.7G in the program, we just see a few more of those pink uh, surfaces appearing. But it, it, it does um, look quite close to what really happened. And I, and I think this is a nice confirmation of these forms of design methods. And then you might say, well, okay, we're, you're meant to be talking about load bearing bridge abutments. At the same university, not the same shaking table, but another one, this is an indoor one, they built a half scale load bearing bridge abutment on a reinforced soil structure. Again, it's using modular blocks. So you can, if we just look at that picture there, it's all nicely labeled for you, but you can see the bridge deck where they place some weights on top to imitate loading on the bridge. And the support wall just slides to the left and right as the wall moves. There is a video that's gonna come up when I press the button again, not quite as exciting as the last video, I'm afraid, but you'll get some idea of, of the sort of shake, shaking that was going on. Again, this would have been shaken with typical real earthquake records up to quite high acceleration. So let's hope it works, here we go. Now I've got to press it one more time. So we just have to wait a second as it starts to get going. In this case, the blocks have not been fixed or, 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 or held down as up ones normally would be with some kind of um, uh, epoxy mortar or something. So they, they wobble a bit, but I mean, essentially after the, the shaking is finished now, uh, you can see that everything behaving perfectly okay. And if we look at the kind of deformations going on there, then in this diagram here, the vertical axis is the elevation up the structure. You can see it's two meters high because it's half scale. And the horizontal axis is the lateral displacement. The um, solid dots are the residual deformations, in other words, after shaking, and the open dots are the, um, the maximum outward position of the wall during the shaking, rather like we saw just now uh, with, with the other tests. The, the, the circular ones were the end of construction deformation. So as a, a summary, this, this form of structure, the load-bearing bridge abutments, supported by polymer geogrid reinforced fill, they've been in service for, for well over 30 years. So there is a, a very good track record. They are, they are not new. Um, we now see that they're being used both with bridge decks using bearings and increasingly with integral abutments. And I, and I think this is a very good combination. Integral abutments combined with reinforced soil abutments. This is a very co good combination and they work well together. We have well-established design methods. These are available for use. And something which I, I mentioned earlier on, but clearly when you're looking at polymer geogrids to hold up bridges for 120 years, you've really got to be very, very confident about the durability and design life of those materials to, to, to give the service required. We've seen measurements of static performance, indicating that generally post-construction deformations are small, and that's what we normally find. In reinforced soil, the majority of deformation takes place early on, uh, during construction and soon after, and then during service, it's very small. And this, this, I mentioned it once before, and I'll mention it again here, ductility of this form of structure makes it highly appropriate for seismic loading, and we've seen that very clearly. If you want to know more about this, there were some very excellent presentations created by uh, Professor Tatsuoka over the last year or two showing experience in Japan with the high-speed rail system there where all structures, pretty well all retaining structures and bridge abutments are now built using reinforced soil techniques. 
I'd just like to acknowledge, I won't read out their names there, you can see them, but various colleagues that helped me with uh, information to help me prepare this, this presentation. So that brings me to a, an end, and I don't know if we have any questions, CMA. Yeah. I've no. been going on here. I don't know what's been, you've been receiving them, have you? No, I yeah. need to check here. Okay. Um, Okay, we have one question here. How long does the geogrid last? It's a very <laughs> actually, generic question, um, but maybe we focus on um, this application. Yeah, so this is, this is uh, related directly to the topic of durability. How long do they last? Um, well, it, there, there, are, there are many geogrids available. Uh, I think what's really important is that they should be tested to make sure that they will last long enough. And I, I mentioned earlier on, there are two main aspects. There is the load bearing capacity, which we investigate by what we call creep testing. And it's best that that's carried out for a very long time. Uh, and also we have durability. So any old geogrid, I can't, I can't answer that question, but geogrids need to be tested. I think the best way to have a, a good, if you like, independent view of that is that they should have certi certificates. Now, we have systems here in Australia. Um, there are also systems in other parts of the world, like the, you have the BBA one in the UK, you have the GEO certificates in Hong Kong. Th these are good because these give you a, a good independent verification of, of how long will they last. Uh, and clearly, to get these certificates, GeoGrid should meet all the requirements of long life. The, the typical design life, as I mentioned earlier on, for bridge abutments, would be either 100 or 120 years, and that's the sort of duration we're looking at. Um, and also questioning how, like, what if, what happens if, if they fail, if the geogrid fails? What happens if the geogrid fails? Well, that's a good question. I mean, if one failed, I don't think you know anything about it because the, the structure is generally fairly redundant, but of course, if, if, if you have a mass failure of geogrid, then, then the structure will collapse. Um, I have seen that occasionally, uh, and, and normally there's a good reason for it. There, there have been some, some quite uh, well publicized cases of, of collapse of structures, not, not load bearing bridge abutments. I've never seen one of those collapse, but of structures in general. Um, but to be honest, if they've been well designed and if the materials are well understood, the safety factors are still quite high on these structures. So really you would not be expecting collapse. Just take one particular situation. What about the facing? How about the facing connection? Oh, that's something that can sometimes go wrong. So again, adequate facing connection strength is important. Um, and especially in load bearing bridge abutments, because there are some quite big forces coming down from the bank seat. So um, that's another area where you might like to think carefully, but there's no duration attached to that. Um, that would be a question of, of performing adequately. So all of these components of the design need to be taken into account carefully in the design process. Sure. Um, next one. So asking about whether they can receive the uh, recording. Yes, it will be uploaded to our website. Um, and the question, imagine whether it fails, the large scale structure is automatically full. Imagine when it failed, the large scale structure. So that's the consequence, basically talking about the consequence of failure of the geogrid. Oh, I think if, yes, if the, if, if the entire structure fails and the bridge is going to come down if it's supporting a bridge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, again, I'd say the safety margins on these designs are, are pretty high. So providing you've got adequate materials and a good design, I, I really can't see that, that being a very high risk. Uh, mention the 0.5% post-construction strain. How high would you go for a bridge abutment? Some government agencies, NZTA in New Zealand, for example, simply say the grid must be inextensible. Yeah, well, this is, this is uh, one of these discussions where I think terminology is not good. We, we have this, this terminology, extensible and inextensible reinforcement. Um, and generally, where we're talking about steel being inextensible uh, and polymer being extensible. However, I think what's important to realize is to understand the nature of the extension. When you build a reinforced soil structure, sure, it does deform, it has to. The, the geogrid has to elongate slightly to start to work. 
Uh, uh, but once it's done that, certainly one or two months after it's, it's, it's completed, the, the, the amount of extension beyond that time is, is very, very small indeed. In fact, you're much more interested in the cyclic behavior than from, from the live loads that might be applied. And uh, in that situation, I think the compatibility of deformation of polymer geogrids and soil is then an advantage. So I, I, I think, I, I, know the, I know the arguments in New Zealand, I've, I've, I've come, come across them many times and I have colleagues there who've been also discussing these things with people there. But um, personally, I, I think for earthquake zones, on places like New Zealand, polymer reinforced soil structures in general and bridge abutments make an awful lot of sense. They can be designed to handle the forces Yet they can still, they, they will be highly ductile and they will survive really strong shaking from earthquakes. All right. Um, we have a few minutes left, uh, four minutes left. I'll go through another question. Um, is Shot Creek facing applicable with reinforced abutments? Actually, that's a good question. And um, I would say yes. Uh, in fact, th there was a paper published um, a few, many years ago of, of just that structure in Hong Kong, uh, but it was a temporary bridge, although I suspect it was there for a long time. And I think there's no reason why not. I, I think probably more for temporary. I'm not sure that you'd want to really have shotcrete up there for a long time. I, I, think, I think preferably just for considering for temporary or, or shorter term use, not for 120 years. Uh, the next one. I understand the geogrid provides a lot of ductility as they can stretch, but how is it they how is it that they are able to help the wall rebound as I assume the polymeric grid would be pushed outside of the elastic range? Well, I think I think the answer there is in the last little bit, because I don't they don't get pushed out of their elastic range. Um, although we design for ultimate limit state. Uh, where you might be looking at strains. I mean, the, the, these, these geogrids fail at quite high strains in the ultimate limit state, but the working stress ranges are just a few percent. So you're, 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 you're still very well within their elastic limits. So uh, when you apply that extra load for a short period of time and it comes off again, the geogrid will recover almost completely. Uh, there's no evidence that it doesn't. So in fact, the, I, I think that the that particular combination is, is particularly good for that sort of situation. So, so the last part of that question really has the answer as well. Perfect. All right, um, this is what we have time for today. Um, thanks, Mike, for um, giving this presentation. Well, thanks for organizing it, CMAC. It's, it's very you. nice to be here in Brisbane uh, again. Yeah. Perfect. And thanks everyone for um, uh, watching us and, um, and listening to our presentation, uh, the webinar today. Um, make sure you go visit our website, um, especially check our events, upcoming events in um, February and March and uh, register for those events and also renew your membership if you haven't done it so, so far. Thanks a lot and uh, we catch you later. Yep. Okay. Thanks very much. Bye.